This week on ANN, Adventist Humanitarian supports Syrian refugees. Young people in the South Pacific exercise the practical side of faith. And members worldwide join in a grassroots prayer initiative. These stories and more coming up. This is ANN, a service of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church. Thanks so much for joining us this week. First in the news, the new year brings a new budget for the Adventist World Church. This year's $174 million budget will fund Adventist mission work and administrative support worldwide. More than $40 million will support regions outside North America and another $28 million will support missionaries and church employees serving worldwide. The budget also supports operations at World Church headquarters, pays the salaries of interdivisional employees, and covers appropriations to the church, world regions, institutions, and programs. You can learn more and request a copy of the 2013 budget online at news.adventist.org. Adventists at a church in South Korea are carrying out the biblical mandate to love your neighbor as yourself. They're impacting members of the local homeless population through practical and spiritual support. The ministry began when two displaced people attended Sabbath worship services at the Minlock Church north of Seoul four years ago. Since then, the small church has connected with close to 60 people through word of mouth. The church provides food clothing, job recommendations, financial counsel, and spiritual support. Ministry leader Young Hua Lee says he can relate to the homeless community. A past business failure gave him first-hand knowledge of despair and how the Adventist message can offer hope for a better future. Thousands of Syrian refugees are receiving winter clothing in time for the cold season, thanks to Adventist humanitarians. The Adventist Development and Relief Agency in Australia is distributing emergency clothing packs to more than 3,000 families stationed at the refugee camps in neighboring Jordan. The Jordanian government is reporting that already close to 200,000 Syrian refugees have entered the country, with more than 1 million expected to flee ongoing Syrian unrest in the coming months. Address Response is targeting families with young children and elderly members groups that are especially vulnerable to harsh winter weather. A Youth Congress this month saw Adventist young people from across the South Pacific exercising the practical side of faith. The event drew more than a thousand youth to Brisbane, Australia, where they worshipped together, attended workshops, and joined in service projects. Young people marched through downtown Brisbane to call for more action to combat hunger worldwide. They also participated in a poverty lunch, skipping their usual meal in an expression of solidarity with the hungry. The event raised 10,000 Australian dollars to support Adventist humanitarians working to end hunger. Groups of young people also worked in the northern suburbs of Brisbane to collect thousands of cans of food for distribution. Youth leaders say they hope the young people learn that by worshiping and serving together, they can help change the world. An Adventist church leader in Africa has clarified comments published last month by the Ugandan newspaper New Vision. The newspaper suggested that Blasius Ruguri, president of the church in East Central Africa, fully supports proposed legislation in Uganda that would criminalize same-sex relationships. Ruguri has since responded to the report, saying the Ugandan media exaggerated statements meant only to imply a disapproval of the gay and lesbian lifestyle. The Adventist Church's official statement on homosexuality prohibits same-sex relationships, but advocates compassion and upholds the dignity of all human beings. Thousands of Adventists worldwide are joining in a grassroots prayer initiative this week. The event called 10 Days of Prayer is a collective call for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit modeled after the New Testament example of Pentecost. Adventists in more than 100 countries were involved in last year's initiative called Operation Global Rain. The Church's Ministerial Association continues to get reports of revival and unity achieved through prayer. Now with a new name and increased support, Church leaders say they're anticipating even more participation this year. Earlier today, I sat down with Derek Morris to learn more. Thanks for joining us, Pastor Morris. Can you tell us how the 10 Days of Prayer uh, contributes to the Revival and Reformation Initiative? 
Well, it's a wonderful combination. If you go to revivalandreformation.org, there's a daily scripture reading, there's 777 prayer initiative. The 10 days of prayer brings a daily Bible study and earnest prayer together in a 10 day journey that's truly life changing. How does the New Testament book of 2 Peter inspire the topics of prayer for this year? Well, we've chosen 2 Peter chapter 1, uh, verses 1 through 11, and it's a journey of growing in grace. And I love the way that Peter begins this second letter. He says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. He's experienced grace in his own life. You think of the times he denied Jesus and he was given grace. And so at the end of this letter, he says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this study that we're doing over these 10 days is helping us to learn how to have that growth in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And it's a life changing journey. Can you share a story that illustrates what happens when people, people pray in this way? I think of a church that was praying and at the end of the service, a, a mother dragged her son forward. He was 37, said, my son needs prayer. And we prayed together and that young man was not only saved from his intentions of committing suicide, but the next week he came with a Bible study in his Bible and, and God changed his life. When people pray in a united way, God works in a miraculous way. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Pastor Morris. Coming up, a ministry that supports and encourages pastors' spouses. Once you enter into that prayer meeting and the Holy Spirit really starts moving on hearts, it's not uh, intimidating at all. It's actually, you feel like a family because there's no barriers. You're very transparent um, and you just feel very, very close. And I think the Holy Spirit just really unites our hearts. And so no one's looking at each other uh, to judge one another. It's just a very loving atmosphere. When we don't know each other and when we're together and when we pray together, there's this feeling of love just for one another when we're praying, especially when we're interceding for one another. When uh, someone would say, oh, I suffered a loss or uh, please pray for my family or my loved ones. And when we're just interceding the prayers, we just pour out what we want for that person to, to happen in that person's life. If we will simply do what God tells us to do in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, where he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. And that's simply what we're coming to do together in united prayer. And it's just amazing to see the revival people are experiencing. I know that prayer is the way to live. And so um, it's a, been a very powerful journey for me. I know God to be faithful to His words and unchanging. Prayer is my life. There's something special about United Prayer. There's something special about coming together as one. Young adults, kids, everyone in between, older adults, and seeing God move. Well, Spirit of Prophecy makes a statement. It said, this promise is made on the condition that the united prayers of the church are offered and in answer to these prayers there may be expected a power greater than that which comes in answer to private prayer. We've actually seen this promise true all around the world as we've been seeing revival and reformation taking place in churches and schools and universities, even in divisions where united prayer has been. God is working and He's pouring out His Spirit. So there is a power in unity and what we see with Operation Global Reign is that it's calling people to lift up their voices together to truly unite um, and bring their petitions and their desires to the throne of God. Welcome back. Being married to a pastor brings expectations few other church members face. A magazine published by the Ministerial Spouses Association supports this unique ministry role. Janet Page has more. Let me share with you about a magazine that has really helped me. It is put out by the Seventh-day Adventist Church four times a year. It's written for ministry spouses and their families. It has articles in it on raising children, on helping your marriage, on helping you to deal with 
issues in your churches, on Bible study, things that will help you personally grow in your spiritual life, even your finances. It also has news about other ministry spouses and what they're doing around the world. And in this issue that's coming out now, the first quarter of the year for 2013, there's uh, one article I especially love, and it's called, when, when the call to ministry interferes with your career, what do you do? And she tells in there, Tina Arnold, of how she gets off the phone, her mind's just reeling with, God, this can't be. We just bought a new house. I got promoted in my career. I'm the coordinator now of my unit at the hospital. Lord, how can this be? And she goes on to tell the journey of what God took her through. I know you would love reading this. And if you'd like to see our archived issues, the, you look at our website, you can find those. Or if you'd like to be receiving it and you're not, and you're a pastor's wife, call your conference and tell them you'd like to get the journal. It will really be a blessing. By the way, if you're a church member, I hope you'll pray for your pastoral couple. They desperately need your prayers. It's church members praying for Jerry and I that changed our lives, that filled us with the Holy Spirit. So please pray for them. It'll change your life too. God bless. A new short story collection recounts the ministry of two Adventist volunteers who served in China. Ricardo Bacchus has a preview in this month's Meet a Missionary feature. Bob and Trevor Burgess, the China Burgesses, have each served the Seventh-day Adventist Church for more than 40 years, 15 of which were in five different countries. Their last assignment was China, directing the Adventist Development and Relief Agency Village Projects. They also taught at a Beijing University so they could receive resident visas to live in China. 100 years after Abram LaRue, a self-supporting missionary to Hong Kong, began his pioneering work in 1888, the Burgesses arrived in China as directors of ADRA. The date was August 8, 1988. 8888. The Chinese believe the number 8 brings wealth and prosperity. On that auspicious note, the Burgesses began their journey of service. They were stepping into the aftermath of a traumatic shift in church operations. Prior to their arrival, governmental regulations forced missionaries out of mainland China. The Adventist Church had no choice but to move to Taiwan, leaving behind 13 hospitals, 80 schools, and hundreds of churches and other assets worth millions of dollars. Their two years in China is an affirmation of God's continual leading in the past, the present, and the future of His church and of His people. This collection of stories is a testament to how the Burgesses never lost sight of God's promise to them and the people of China. You can order a copy of The Bright Side of China at your local Adventist Book Center or by emailing the Burgesses at bobtreva48 at yahoo.com. Half of the proceeds go toward Adventist mission work. Now let's turn to Megan Bronner to find out what our social media followers are praying for during 10 days of prayer. This week, we're in the middle of our 10 days of prayer, a time when Adventists around the world are joining together to pray through a number of verses in 2 Peter chapter 1. This week in social media, we wanted to share some of the things you prayed for during the last few days. On Facebook, Eileen told us that she said a prayer for her faith to grow stronger every day. Peter shared that he asked for forgiveness, wisdom, peace, and strength to overcome temptation while Thelma prayed for her children to come to know God. And Tunisia asked God for the strength to overcome temptations and for the knowledge to distinguish between good and evil. Lizzie prayed for open doors and for her family to know God more. And Charity shared a prayer for financial freedom, true love in her life, and health, especially for her mother. If you'd like to read the rest of the prayers or share your own so far, head to our Facebook page or follow us on Twitter. You can learn more about 10 Days of Prayer on the Revival and Reformation website. Also, make sure to check out the 10 Days of Prayer videos on our Vimeo page. Click on the 10 Days of Prayer channel to watch all of them. We hope to hear more from you. How should the Adventist Church use tithe? A new issue of the Dynamic Steward Journal explores conclusions by a group of pastors, teachers, and church administrators. Larry Evans has more. When Jesus said not to store up for ourselves treasures on earth, but rather store them up in heaven. What kind of treasures do you think he was talking about? When Malachi says we rob God by not returning our tithe and offerings, is he limiting our treasures to money? What really is a treasure? 
In the next issue of the Dynamic Steward, we will be addressing questions like these. For the past five years, a committee of 100 pastors, teachers, and administrators have studied in depth the way the church uses tithe. In this issue of the Dynamic Steward, we ask Elder Robert Lemon, General Conference Treasurer, and Dr. Angel Rodriguez, former director of the Biblical Research Institute, to explain the actions taken at the recent annual council concerning the use of tithe. I'm sure you're going to find that very interesting. I also feel that you have heard stories about the Lord's protection when His people are faithful. But the article by former GC Vice President Phil Follett shares about the rewards of faithfulness when things do not go our way. His perspective blessed me. Included in this issue are other stimulating and inspiring articles. If you would be interested in subscribing to the electronic version of this quarterly journal, it's free, please email us at the address that you see below. Still ahead on ANN, the church's first female vice president talks about the changing role of women in ministry. But up next, a preview of this week's Bible study lesson. Hi, my name is Carrie, and I just want to share what a blessing it has been for me to be a part of the united prayer that we've had in our church. We've probably had a number of Global Reign um, prayer times together, and I have seen the mighty power of God work in our church family with bringing healing and forgiveness, and just seeing the power of God work in our children, and I just, uh, want to encourage all of you to join this time. It is not an option to come together in night of prayer. It is a necessity. So please, I encourage you to join with your church family and even in your own family to come together and pray because um, pray, God has promised where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of you. I firmly believe that true freedom comes from a connection with Jesus Christ. He himself said in John chapter 8, those whom the Son has set free are free indeed. That means freedom from guilt, freedom from fear. That means an assurance there is a transcendent power who is working that together for my good. Praying together with people, uniting with, with God, seeking Him as one, there's nothing like it. And I just want you to imagine with me over thousands of churches coming together, praying, thousands of people, maybe even over a million. What is God going to do? I don't know, but I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be there, and I hope you'll be praying with me. Welcome back. Let's turn to Benita Shields to find out what this week's Bible study lesson has in store. This week's lesson begins with an earth without form. The Creator proceeded to form His creation through the power of His Word. Nothing was left to chance. Creation was an intentional, thoughtful, powerful act by an intentional, thoughtful, powerful Creator God. On the first day, he formed the 24-hour cycle of day and night. On the second day, he formed the firmament, a means by which to divide the water below from the water above it. On the third day, he formed the dry land and vegetation. The gods of evolutionary theory use competition and elimination of the weak by the strong in order to create a world. But our God used the power of his word to form a world with the intention to fill it with created beings with whom he could share his love. Whether forming a world or forming a new heart within us, our Creator does so intentionally, powerfully, and thoughtfully. No Big Bang can accomplish that. You can download or order the current edition of the Church's Bible Study Guide online at absg.adventist.org. We'll bring you a preview of all the upcoming lessons here on a and Video in the coming weeks. The Adventist Church's television network recently polled thousands of young people to learn how they would like to impact their generation. Carmen McMurdy has this report. 
Hope Channel rang in the new year with over 3,000 young people at GYC. That's the Generation of Youth for Christ convention in Seattle. To find out what young people had to say about Christian television and missions, Hope Channel conducted a survey that included a free iPad drawing. The free iPad drew many to the exhibit, but more exciting was the response to the survey. One of the questions was, if money and time were not an issue, what would you do to reach out to your generation with the message of a fulfilling Christian lifestyle? Here are some of the answers we received. I'd give Bible studies all day. I'd open a vegan restaurant, build an orphanage, go overseas and be a missionary. I'd feed the hungry, start a Facebook ministry, take time to be friends with everybody, and of course, our favorite, I'd support Christian television. For Hope Channel, I'm Carmen McMurdy. A new Android app brings the writings of church co-founder Ellen White to your smartphone or tablet. Daryl Thompson has more on this week's Tech Corner. Today I want to talk to you about something really special that I'm holding here in my hand, and that is the Android version of EGW Writings. In this version of the app, you know, we're really proud of it. It comes in not just English, but it comes in nine languages. And it's an app that you can download and put on your phone or your tablet. Now, Android version of the app does run on some other devices as well. You can go to Amazon's website if you have a, a Kindle device and you can down EGW Writings for the Kindle Fire. Or you can go to the BlackBerry App World store and you can download for the playbook EGW Writings. If you visit Barnes & Noble's website, you can download for the Nook Color or the Nook Tablet EGW Writings as well. So, EGW Writings, check it out. It is a fantastic app that can be greatly used to enhance your um, reading time. If you're in the doctor's office, you can pull it out and read some passages. Or maybe you're driving to work in your car. Do you know that you can listen to any of the audiobooks through TTS, streaming directly live to your phone. So why not check out egwwritings.org on Android today. Every month at ANN Video, we sit down with a prominent church leader for a feature we call Dialogue. This month, we spoke with Adventist World Church Vice President Ella Simmons. Thank you, Dr. Simmons, for joining us this morning. Dr. Simmons, how have you worked for the church? In what capacities have you worked? You know, it seems like just a few days because mm -hmm. I've enjoyed my work over the years, but in all, I've actually worked for the church nearly 30 years. If I include about five years that I worked for our local church when our children were young. But I have worked in various places, mm -hmm. but almost always in education until the past seven years. Excellent. And the past seven years you have served as Vice President for the General Conference. That's right. What is the, your favorite part of that job? There's so many facets to this job. You know we are all general vice presidents, which mm -hmm. mean that we, means that we do a little uh, of, of many things. Mm -hmm. But I, I like policy development. Mm -hmm. I am one of those people who really enjoys that, mm -hmm. but more so. I enjoy meeting God's people all over the world and going and ministering to and serving the people in their lives, where they live their lives. Many people may not realize that you are the first female vice president yes. of the General Conference. How do you, what impact do you think that has made on the church or maybe even on the people whom you meet as you go out into the field? What I'm learning from the people in the field mm -hmm. is that, one, um, people have actually said to me, this brings hope for women and young people. Mm -hmm. Now, they don't classify me as one of the young people, mm -hmm. but they see uh, the decision that was made back in 2005 sort of as a change, a growth in the church, and they mm -hmm. share that with me. It gives them hope, they say. I, I don't always understand the full context, you know, mm -hmm. but I understand what it means to have hope for involvement 
and I think that's it. Everyone wants to do what God has called him or her to do, and it is from that perspective, I think, that they speak. I have been told and I have felt as well that my serving in this capacity has opened the minds of some who just had not really ever thought about a woman being called by God to do these kinds of things at this level of leadership in the church. And, and perhaps they see that women have a lot to offer uh, the church, but not only in this level, this role, but in a wide range of roles. Because I suppose when one looks at my life, probably you can see the roles of women in the world because I'm a wife and mother and grandmother and I, I have enjoyed that when that was my sole fo focus. I've been an educator teacher and academic administrator. I've enjoyed that. And then now this role. So I suppose it, it sort of broadens the perspective. Dr. Simmons, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been a pleasure speaking you. with you. God bless you in your ministry. It's been my pleasure and may God bless you as well. Now let's turn to David Trim for a look at Adventist history. This week, the first local church is organized under the name Seventh-day Adventists. Welcome to a new year of This Week in Adventist History. On January 7 in 1961, Frank Hale Jr., addressing the Chicago chapter of the Oakwood Alumni Association, recommended the creation of an organization of black laymen. As a result, a month later, the Laymen's Leadership Conference was founded, which campaigned against racial prejudice in the Adventist church. On January 7, 1962, the first Thai language Adventist radio program was broadcast with Sopon Jaiguar as speaker. On January 10, in 1886, the first SDA church in the Southern Hemisphere was organized in the city of Melbourne, Australia, after evangelistic meetings led by John O. Corliss. On January 11, 1944, the Seventh day Adventist Health Food Company in Brazil was legally incorporated thanks to the leadership of Ernesto Beirold. On January 12, in 1861, while staying in Parkville, Michigan, Ellen G. White was shown in vision that, contrary to the hopes of abolitionist Adventists and others in the north of the United States, that country's civil war would be a long and bloody one. Exactly one year later, in tiny Washington, New Hampshire, a Seventh-day Adventist church was organized the first local church to be organized anywhere under the name Seventh-day Adventist. And also on January 12, but 113 years later in 1975, the Breath of Life telecast first aired in the city of Detroit, Michigan. That was This Week in Adventist History. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. In the meantime, check out our Facebook page. You can connect with other Adventists worldwide and find links to all our stories, photos, and videos. Just visit facebook.com slash Adventist News. Our good news for this week comes from Psalms. The passage says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. That's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit news.adventist.org for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless.